Good morning, everybody in TV land. This is Mike Hidner with Historic Point Boss Update. Today joining me on my right is Tom Bramer. Welcome, Tom. Good morning. Good morning. We're going to talk, uh, as you can see, Tom is dressed up in his winter best. Yes. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, our ice harvest, which is on January 28th, part of the Port Edwards Lions Fishery at Nepco Lake. And we're going to talk a little bit about our winter feast, which is at the Nakusa Senior Community <coughs> Center uh, on February 17th. So we're going to talk about a couple events, but let's first talk, Tom, about what are you wearing today? <laughs> <laughs> I'm wearing my winter woolies. Uh, Pierre would have had to have uh, good winter gear. For sure. For sure, living out in, uh, in, in our area. When you think about living in a, in a cabin uh, or even a, just a house in those days and working outside, yeah. uh, you needed a good uh, set of, of winter clothes, probably more than maybe one. <clears throat> and, and maybe you wore a lot of this inside quite a oh, bit of the time too. <clears throat> I was li listened to a thing one day on public television where a guy was living in a cabin mm -hmm. and he says any day it's 40 degrees is fine. So he was wearing lots of clothes all the time. What <clears throat> when I'm wearing a, the, the, this is a blanket shirt. Some people call it a wumus. I'm not sure where that comes from. I think it might be a, a native word. And it's a collar with just a lace up yeah, just a button in the front. And the button in the front. Uh, to mm -hmm. keep it, you know, keep the warm. Um, <clears throat> but uh, it's it's not the, the the coat split down the middle, the, the capot that we think of with the made from a blanket with the hood. Um, now, would you wear a capot over this? Maybe when you it's might, extremely cold? It's really cold. Yes. If I had one big enough. Yes. Um, or you can wear layers underneath. It's plenty big to wear layers underneath. Uh, this one is made just like the regular shirts that we wear. This. Mm hmm and you wear layers, so uh, maybe I might wear two linen shirts underneath here when it's really, really cold or whatever. So that concept of layers had oh, a yes. beginning a long, long time ago. Just put more clothes on. Yeah. yeah, and nowadays we talk about layers again. You <laughs> exactly, know. Yes. exactly. Um, I'm wearing uh, fingerless mittens or gloves, I guess you'd call them. Uh, there's no, no fingers there. When, these, when I first was introduced to these, I thought they were really dumb. Mm -hmm. But you know, if you keep your palm of your hand, keep that warm and good circulation, and if you're not touching metal uh, or ice or you know, but just out, you'd be surprised how warm your fingers stay, uh, and you can work. I, for one, can't work very good with mittens or gloves. <clears throat> so these these aren't aren't that bad. I I'm kind of been surprised over the last few years how they how well they work. Yeah, and it, it's surprising like you said if maybe it's one circulation of those circulation thing I think is what it is. Yeah, here. it's one of those things if you can keep circulation all the way to your fingers then the fingers will be warm. They'll stay warm too. Yeah. Yeah. No, also used because if you're hunting. Maybe yeah, with that gun. I would think or, although I we were at the Nakusa Christmas parade and I carried my musket in the parade mm -hmm. and uh I really wish I'd had my mittens on because <laughs> that metal was cold. Yeah. But it, it was fine. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wearing leather leather pants. Mm -hmm. uh, easy to go yeah. that way anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, leather pants, and you would have wore maybe a layer or so underneath. Maybe the leggings that you wore in the summertime, you might put on underneath the, the these here to stay warm. These uh, moccasins. There's actually two pairs of moccasins there, one inside the other. Mine, uh, the inside one, are made of very thick felt, much like we think of in a, in a boot liner today, in a mm -hmm. snowmobile boot or whatever, that same concept mm -hmm. with the thick felt. Uh, <clears throat> I have seen a deal where they made a pair of moccasins from beaver hide with the skin on, or with the hair still on, mm -hmm. and the hair on the inside. For, in, and for then, insulation. For insulation, and then put the over boot over that. Oh, so wow. that was fur and leather and then more leather. These are waterproofed. Um, I use mink oil and beeswax. Um, there's as many combinations as there are people that do it. No, does this have any arch in it, Tom? No, or? and they're flat as a pancake inside. There's a number, I can see at least five layers of leather mm -hmm. on, on the, the bottom sole. on that sole. Mm -hmm. It's, um, I think, if I'm not mistaken, it's a Fort Legionnaire style moccasin that has that hard, built up soul and 
be honest with you, walking in them um, any distance, you're better off on snowshoes or in the snow than you are on hard ground mm -hmm. because these are, they can be slippery. Um, now we have a pair of ice grippers, they're metal, were made by a blacksmith that would go over your arch, uh, saddle your arch, and then there's four Prongs. spikes that come down mm -hmm. to keep you on ice. They, they, you lace them over your boot. Um, or I was just told not too many months ago that uh, they would take the suede type leather uh, where it's like this here that mm -hmm. that uh, the suede suede, suede leather smooth side, it, and yeah. just tie some leather around the foot when just that little bit of extra grip mm -hmm. will help on on certain uh, will improve the the footage because otherwise these can be a little slippery. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, they could have also taken a, on, on my shins here, uh, much like we wear gaiters or that when we're snowshoeing or, or cross country skiing. These are to help keep the, the snow in that from getting in your boot. No, are these, Tom, just wrapped it's a strap. around? It's a strip about that wide, it's blanket, two layers thick, and it's quite long. And you wrap it around and wrap it around. It helps keep your extremities warm and dry. Mm -hmm. And keep the snow from going inside your so boot. So it's not a sock. A sock no, no, no. would be inside yeah. of this. This is like almost the, we all see the World War One pictures with the doughboys with their. That's the same yeah. concept. Or or equivalency today would be like an ace bandage, right. but but different material. Now, yeah, of course. and this is just wool. It's blanket material, probably left over. Now, these happen to be kind of I don't know greenish grayish, mm -hmm. but you could if you were making a coat or something else with you'd have some strips with, some, with a blanket. You'd have some stuff left over. There you use it. Mm -hmm. You might make some socks. Or you could wrap this type of thing around your foot mm -hmm. instead of a sock if you didn't have somebody to to knit you socks. So yeah, that's very, the, very that good. one. And and have you should I say road tested these yet? I have. I have. <laughs> uh, I've had this is the third winter that I've used them. Okay. And uh, I I love them. They're they're great. Uh, anytime I don't have cold feet, uh, you feel I'm good. a happy man. Yeah. Um, my hat is a I think it's called a Canadian style hat. If you, uh, many of them have a little pom-pom uh, of fur right mm -hmm. here in the middle. This sure. one does not, um, but it's got white uh, mink fur around the edge. It's wool blanket material, and it keeps you warm pretty good. Um, I, it's a little big, and I like it that way, so that I can kind of yep. cover, cover up the top of my ears. That also kind of helps keep keep you cold or warm. Um, I've got a scarf. And I mean, just like we wear them today, for around your neck, or if it's really windy and cold, over your head, almost babushka style, mm -hmm. to keep your ears extra warm. Mm -hmm. These don't. This doesn't fold down to cover your ears in the, very in well. In the day we're filming this, folks, is uh, windy wind from the northwest, mm -hmm. and that would feel good around yeah, the ears if yeah. you're going outside for very yeah. long. Yeah, if you were going to be outside traveling very long, uh, one of these is is really good. And I asked my wife when we left home today, <clears throat> she's a knitter, I said, how, you know, how far back does knitting go? Mm -hmm. And she says, at least to the Middle Ages, mm -hmm. and maybe a good deal further back. Um, it's a, and men used to do it. That was the one thing I didn't know. She said it started out as a man's craft, and then became a, a woman's uh, Those doggone craft. women took another thing away from us. That's all right. I, I tried knitting once, believe me. I'm glad they well, did. Well, and it's still, a, a, Tom, a men's craft in, in certain regards because I know, I know of, I don't know, but some surgeons would do knitting to keep the dexterity ah. in their fingers and everything, and so they did knitting just as to keep that up. Well, we remember that uh, when we were younger, um, Roosevelt Greer used to play for the for the uh, Giants. No, no, for the uh, Detroit Lions. Lions. Yeah, he was the first 300-pound NFL lineman, and he did needlepoint just to keep his mind from getting too excited and and to calm him down before the game. Mm -hmm. And nobody ever picked on him. Of course, he was 300 pounds <laughs> and a very scary-looking man. Yeah. I wouldn't pick on him either. No, but no. He, <clears throat> that that kind of thing, you know, like you say, it just it. He liked to do that, and it kind it of gives dexterity. Yep. Kind of calms you down. It's kind of meditative. Yep, almost. yep, yep, yep. The last thing I have to do show you is is uh, my mittens, and uh, these are made from another piece of blanket. 
um, cut out rather than knitted. And a lot of times if the men were out on their own and didn't know how to knit, uh, you, could, you could kind of sew a little bit. It's but, what, uh, what they call what, a blanket stitch? Tom? A blanket stitch, yeah. And, and you could figure out how to cut those out, but that's a, made just from a, a trade blanket. Mm. The scraps of one from whatever, if part of it was wore out, or if you made a shirt or a capot or whatever, there might be some leftovers and waste not, want not. Yeah. Now, Tom, on your shirt here, could you fold those cuffs down, say, if... Maybe yeah, if, you could, you just, yeah. if you just had these fingerless yeah, gloves, you could, you could cover the end. the end of your fingers. I, I think so. Yeah. Um, they're rolled up like that on me because I'm I'm short, mm -hmm. and I've now this was not made for me. Mm -hmm. I, I bought it from a reenactor supply place. It's a wool blanket, and uh, but I imagine that some people that are as large as I am around probably are a good deal taller. So they do, and a cuff, like you say, is always a good it, and it to have also, anyway. Cuff is somewhat <clears throat> uh, a little bit fancier, I yeah. would say, fancier. Now, Tom, for our, well, you didn't mention your. Oh, I didn't, no. The, the sash is yeah. kind of the, the, the French Canadian badge of honor sort mm -hmm. of thing. Uh, they were made, uh, these are, this is the loom made one. They were made in L'Assomption, Canada, near Montreal. Is this a certain pattern? Um, Do we know? Yes, it is, and what they call it, I don't remember. Okay. But there were some blue ones and some red ones, and I think there were some that were kind of yellow with blue and red. And, and is it wool also? Yes. It's wool yeah, it's, also. it's the real fine wool thread, mm -hmm. and it's woven. Uh, they were started out being finger woven mm -hmm. years and years ago, um, and the Indians picked up on them quickly also they like the the, the the color and they work great for for being an extra pocket mm. you can stick stuff you know your your knife or your whatever you can kind of use it as a as a, a, a place to stash the little mm. things because you didn't have a belt other nope, than this didn't have a pocket neither yeah, yeah. so uh, maybe your money would even be in there if you had if some. i had money yeah, uh, what yeah. would i use it for but right, okay I'll, right. I'll give you that <clears throat> but uh um yeah then and it also kind of keeps your, your heat in too a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, you don't want any too much draft, uh, just like your jacket nowadays with the string in the Cinch, middle to, yeah. the, to keep your keep your, your body heat close to your yeah. to yourself. That's kind of interesting because now we've we've seen Tom here, you know, a dozen, fifteen, twenty times, and he's <laughs> had his summer clothes yep. or his seasonal clothes yep. on, and now this is his winter outfit, yep. and he made a. a, a adjustment today and an idea that to bring in his winter clothes just to show you how we dress because when you see him uh, on Heritage Holiday, uh, uh, which is on the uh, 19th, uh, you'll see him in this sort oh, yes. of thing. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So. And, and we wore it like for the Christmas parade at Nakusa and, and other times when we're out uh, at the site, even in the, uh, in the spring, if it's not really warm well and i would imagine we're wanna, you on, know. on sugar bush days yeah we would probably do something like yep. this on the sugar bush yep. day so uh, it's the 60 uh, the, the heritage, heritage holiday, holiday 16th. 16th yeah yeah so this coming saturday yeah. we're, we're filming this on a tuesday yeah on the uh 12th so uh yeah so thank you for well, bringing that in i hope you don't roast during the rest of the well, time well i think i'll be okay and i needed to get it out so i could wear it on saturday anyway so it's all set i'll, I'll tell him to turn set. the lights down so it doesn't get too hot there we you. go yes there we go. yes so now we're going to talk <laughs> about our our ice cutting uh which we call ice harvest uh, it's on nepco lake part of the port edwards lions fishery we're uh, extremely happy and proud to be a, a part of their fishery they've had a long long tradition and do great uh, work within the communities, supporting different civic projects and youth groups and things like that. And and we've had a long association with the Port Edwards Lions. Uh, in fact, in our first uh, or second, uh, maybe a couple of festivals, they provided the food for it. They brought mm -hmm. their little, they have a little, at least at that time, they had a little trailer where they dispensed their food out of and everything. And we did have the wherewithal yet to do that within our own. So we invited them down and they did that for us. So we have. 32 years association actually with the Port Edwards Lions. And the uh, fishery was a good opportunity for us. We used to cut ice. Uh, previously, we cut it on some private ponds. 
We cut it on the Cranberry Marsh for a couple of years, which was right across the road on County Trunk Z from the uh, historic Point Boss site. But this gave us an opportunity to have the public involved in it, whether they wanted to just see it or if they wanted to partake in it. It was an opportunity for that to happen where we didn't have that. So it gave us a public venue for it, and I think that's worked very well. So it'll be on uh, January 28th, which is a Sunday. It used to be Super Bowl Sunday. That's when they did their fishery. But, of course, Super Bowl's one week later now. Uh, it's an opportunity to make a little more money, but no, no offense to the NFL. But uh, it's uh, a great opportunity to come out. We have a presence on the ice. Uh, we start cutting about 10 a.m., and we have a presence on the ice until 1 p.m. So if you want to come out and see us actively cutting or doing something on the ice, I'd come out some beti somewhere between 10 and 1. 1 is the kind of the tail end of it. And you'll see us cutting with the uh, historic ice saws, uh, which look uh, a little bit like regular saws we used to cut wood, except the, the teeth are much bigger and wider apart, and the saw is much thicker because it's going through ice, not through wood. So uh, we have about, I think about six total of those saws, about uh, three or four long ones and, and three short ones, in which we use for trimming. The, the smaller saws are only about 30 inches or 28 inches, and they're for trimming the, the ice when we cut it. Now, this year we haven't uh, yet set up our, our, our area for cutting. When you go by Nepco Lake, when you see a, a snow fence uh, to the east, uh, when you're going, uh, North on Highway 13, our, our ice fence is in that area, just uh, adjacent to the swimming area on the, on the uh, uh, county park there. And you'll see this uh, orange uh, snow fence surrounding some of these. You wonder what the heck's going on out there. And then once in a while you see, uh, if you have the opportunity, some people out there foolishly shoveling that area. Yes. <laughs> who goes out and shovels the ice, but uh, <laughs> our theory, and I don't know if it's correct or not, but I guess we believe it, is that uh, if there's no insulation on the ice, no snow on the ice, that it'll freeze further and make it thicker. We've, we've had it as much as two and three inches thicker in our field where we shoveled as opposed, because we tested it a mm -hmm. few years ago, and it, depending on the weather, of course. Mm -hmm. But if we have good cold weather in January, um, we can drive it down an extra four inches. Yeah, and we've had ice thicknesses anywhere from 14 inches to probably 23, 24 yeah. inches. So it just depends on the year. I think, uh, what was it, last year, the year before, it didn't really get a, two years ago, I think, it didn't really get a, a it got a real late freeze and cold spell. So mm -hmm. we didn't have, we were worried we weren't even going to be able to, in fact, I don't think we even drove on the ice that year because we, carted the ice off, I think, because we were afraid I, I the ice so. thickness. I, there was twice that I know remember over the many years that we had to use um, four-wheelers mm -hmm. to haul the blocks to, to shore. Uh, to shore. Mm -hmm. And I think mostly it wasn't that the ice was not too thick, but where you get on and off the ice, it, it was thin and it cracked, and then we didn't want to lose a truck in there. So. Or, or get stranded. Yes. It might be a problem. So, yeah. so we'll be... Uh, Cutting the ice, uh, you can come out, you can lend a hand to us. Uh, we encourage people to uh, take an opportunity to cut ice. We would suggest that you wear some boots, of course, because it's wet where we're cutting the, the ice and also tends to be a little slippery. So if uh, you're cutting ice, if you've got some kind of a, uh, grips or something that you have, it'd be, it'd be advantageous to have something like that because we haven't well, I guess when we only lost one person in the water one time, but he came out we about didn't as lose quick. Him. No, no, he came out about as quick as he went in. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. And and to give him uh, his due, uh, this was Tracy Rice, and, and about uh, four years ago, I think, he went in and came, you know, came right back, back out, out, and he went home, changed his clothes, and he came back for more. So I mean, there's a guy that's uh, persevering. So. Yes, yes. <laughs> I, I think I'd have stayed home when it was warm, but he, he did come back, and I, I got to give him all the credit. Well, and, and we cut ice no matter what the weather is. We've had some days where it's been below zero with the wind blowing out of the northwest, and and your breath would freeze on, like in Tom and I's case, our beards or mustaches, or, you know, it was very cold. And we've had other days we've had people, in, not Tom and I, but we've had people in shirt sleeves. But yeah, and it's rained once or twice. Yeah. It's not hard. Right. But we've had some where it was 32 and it kind of that, ooh, the, I'd almost rather have the cold. Yeah, or snow would be better. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. So in any way, we cut about 40 blocks. Uh, takes us uh, approximately two hours or so to cut those 40 blocks. And then we haul them 
to our site. Our three bay shed has one section of the three bay shed has an ice house built into it. So from 11 to three, if you wanna come down, you can also see us putting the ice in the ice house and how we pack it and store it and put the uh, sawdust around it and, and, and that sort of thing. So there's approximately 40 blocks. What do we figure, Tom? Uh, two ton, maybe? Oh yeah, at least. About yeah. two ton of ice we store and we use it for events during the summer, during our festival and other events. For demonstrating we make ice cream, we chip it up and make ice cream. It's around the ice cream makers, the insulation around those. We also put it in our, our, our tanks that hold our beverages for keeping it cool and, and refreshing for you folks when you come out to our to our, our Point Boss Pioneer Festival. So we have a use for this ice, and also it was something the Wakeleys would have done. I think Rob Nury is the one that got us started on this. He had a friend that had a pond, and he came up with the idea of, hey, we should be cutting ice. So of course, we do cut ice now. And I think it adds one of the few events we actually don't do on site, uh, all of it, because we just uh, we could cut on the river or the creek, but the, the thickness of the ice is so, indetermined that uh, we're afraid we might have somebody fall in or somebody get injured or something and we certainly want to prevent that. Uh, our first goal is safety, uh, uh, though sometimes when Tom's on a roof I don't know if that is a goal. But I don't do roofs anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I quit that. <laughs> But uh, th that's a that's a great uh, a great event, and we invite you out. The, the Port Edwards Lions put it on. They have a nice uh, in the uh, in the uh, warm up building there. They got a heated building out there that uh, the county has provided uh, to the citizens of Wood County, and they rent that. And so they have a, a chili dump. They have uh, hot dogs. They have different food available. Uh, they have raffles going on all the time. Uh, People are, they're announcing out on the lake there, I think probably about every five minutes, somebody winning something. So it's a good opportunity to come out and support their things and to see us. I think uh, uh, the two of us together are kind of a nice uh, combination because we do something kind of a display and they're doing selling things and promoting things and, and they have a fish contest, of course, that's where it all goes from, is the fishery and then they measure up and give prizes for different size fish in different categories. And I think maybe based on age too, a little bit of kids might have a separate I, I'm category. I'm not sure, but they could be that there's a Could kids. have a separate category, but uh, a good project to support, uh, no charge uh, uh, for us and no charge by the Port Edwards Lions. Uh, just come on out and support it. We cut on the ice again from about 10 to one and we stack the ice, the first load goes about 11 down to the site to our three bay shed in the ice house and we start stacking up right after 11 and we go to approximately, we're finished about three o'clock. So, so that's a, a good opportunity for, for you to do that. Mm -hmm. The next event we wanna talk about is our, our winter feast. Now Robert Wakeley will look for any opportunity and is in to celebrate uh, uh, the, the coming of together of friends and, and family and a time to celebrate. And he had uh, what they uh, what they called, uh, I guess, uh, what do they call it? Cotillion. Cotillion, they call it. They was dancing <laughs> and music and, and lots of food and I'm sure some imbibing. Uh, they did a lot of great things like that and even the newspapers, they, they mentioned two or three times how great time they had down at Robert Wakeley's. And generally most of the newspaper articles we've seen have been from February. So we've taken our winter feast and we do it in February. It's on February 17th at the Nakusa Senior uh, Community Center uh, in Nakusa. Easy to find, we'll have signage up for you to find that and it's, kind of like Thanksgiving and Christmas all rolled into one. Tom, why don't you talk a little bit about, we don't have the menu you know, set mm -hmm. totally yet, but we've got a pretty good idea of menu. We've, we're headed down the road. In fact, I spent about an hour with one of the guys on the phone yesterday <clears throat> making sure that we, he's getting us supposedly some rabbit and some raccoon. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> the rabbit would be domestic rabbit, um, some friends of mutual friends of his and mine. Uh, raise rabbits for commercial purposes, and they're donating some. And a uh, uh, trapper from over to the east of us here, if things work out, we should get some raccoon from him. Um, there's some local trappers in the area here that we've uh, gotten muskrat and beaver from at different times. And we're hopeful for that again. We have some venison in the freezer. Could use a little more if you're looking to donate some. I know where you can get rid of it. Uh, but uh, we, we should be 
if we didn't get much more, maybe a little more venison burger, but yeah. uh, the, the full muscle uh, venison, mm -hmm. we should be okay. We're going to do uh, probably a venison stew for sure. Past that, Lord only knows. We've had all kinds of suggestions. Yeah, and we've got uh, the sauerkraut that we <clears throat> we made on the site during our harvest fair in September. And now we put it in the freezer after it was uh, ripe, and now that'll be used in different dishes mm -hmm. that we'll have also at Winter Feast. So it's a kind of extension from the harvest fair right. into this, <clears throat> and kind of showing you what they would have done, and probably a lot of dishes. We have a wild game license yes. for this that we get from Got the- Got it already too. Yes. Uh, uh, last Sunday was at my son's house and he always helps me fill that out because he's much more techie than it's, I am. It's all it, online now. Yeah, it's all online. And he's much more techie than I am. So he sits down with me and we put all the information in and uh, the DNR does run a uh, consumer line even during the day, even on weekends. We hit the, the send button, and before we left his house, there was a reply from the gal that it had been received. Mm -hmm. And when I got home Sunday night, about 11 o'clock, the wild game serving permit was in my inbox. Oh, wow. Now that, I mean, That's I complain service. about the DNR just like everybody else does. But when you talk about service, and just as, you know, friendly and, and can we do anything else? They they send it now to the warden and to the health department. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I have the permit and all I have to do is sign it, but it's contingent upon the warden's approval and the uh, county health department. We've never had a problem with either one of them. Mm -hmm. um, at one time we had to go in and check with them. Now the DNR does it electronically with them. And I, I couldn't believe it. In less than eight hours, that permit was filed and approved and done. Yeah. Would you explain it, Tom, a little bit to the public? Uh, when we talk about wild game, we're talking about the raccoon and the mm -hmm. venison and, and mm -hmm. you know, the, this sort of thing, beaver. But we're not talking about waterfowl. Would you explain right. that? <clears throat> the waterfowl are covered by a federal regulation because they're migratory not only between states, but between countries, Canada and the U.S. And so federal regulations say that you cannot charge for wild game that they are responsible for. Mm -hmm. If we were to give it away, then we could have uh, ducks and geese and whatever. We did at one time, but this that's a new federal thing. It's about the last 10 years. <clears throat> so uh, we no longer can, can do, it's got nothing to do with food safety or anything else, it's that the federal regulations say you cannot harvest a waterfowl or a migratory bird and sell it, mm -hmm. no matter what. If you had it free or a, a donation right. sort of thing, well, you could do it. Well, even then. You, the, oh, yeah, you mean uh, like a free will donation, well. I suppose. I, I, I don't know, I don't want to go there. So, uh, but right in the thing, when we get the permit from the DNR, that's big black letters underneath there so that you know that this is not, and it's, they don't care, mm -hmm. but they also have to inform us of the federal regulations and it's just fine. So if anybody has anything to donate like venison, Tom has asked for a little more venison mm -hmm. or something like that, or if you have something wild, it's okay, but not waterfall. Yeah. We just can't take waterfall. Wild turkey. Um, is okay. Yeah, doves and um, waterfowl that migra migrate, migratory waterfowl that's covered by a federal mm -hmm. uh, federal duck stamp or whatever that's that's where you can't you can't, can't do it. it yeah so uh, winter feast is a lot of fun the oh. Wake, Wakeley's had a great time doing music it. this yeah, year yeah Ooh. yeah we got a group from Westby Wisconsin uh, up to eight members I'm not exactly sure how many can make it but it's very period music um, people uh, with guitars and fiddles and they sing and they were at our summer festival last year and they, they played during the day some at their campsite but then in the evening after we'd had our, our supper and whatever the girls came out sat by the campfire and played for about an hour 
it was the coolest thing. Yes. It really was. And and they also will, they have a caller which is in their group, and so we'll have some uh, uh, period-type dancing that'll be mm -hmm. done, and we invite the public if they'd like to join us. And there's always a bunch of us members that do it, but we certainly in invite the public to partake in mm -hmm. that. Uh, we uh, Stella Michaels, one of our members, puts together some... Uh, gift baskets that you can take chances raffle things, on, yeah. raffle chances, and really nice combinations, uh, usually themed to a certain, you know, sportsman's or whatever it mm -hmm. might be themed for, that sort of thing. So it's a good evening. It starts at 4 o'clock gathering. We have a hot apple cider and some hors d'oeuvres, some cheese trays, some sausage and that sort of thing. And then about 10 to 5, you, we get everybody to sit down and then we go through the kind of the course of the evening and then we start eating about five o'clock and uh, for me i think it's one of the fastest days because oh. you, you start at four o'clock well <laughs> we know we start before four, <laughs> we four start thursday afternoon at three <laughs> yeah, o'clock yeah. <laughs> but uh when we're doing the food preparation yeah. i think thursday afternoon and friday and then of course all day saturday but as far as the event itself goes very very fast speak and i thought of something yes for those that really don't care for wild game, we have ham and chicken and dressing and potatoes and vegetables and and the plain sauerkraut and all that sort of stuff, bread pudding for dessert. There is more than enough if you don't care for wild game. And it's all Just, marked. Yeah, oh yeah, oh, it, it, big signs on it so you know what you're getting. If you don't care for that, don't eat it. Yeah, yeah. Not and a it, problem. And it's very reasonably priced. It's a fundraiser for us. Yep. but. Uh, uh, certainly got to cover expenses, the band, the food, and the hall, mm -hmm. and things like that. So it's $20 uh, uh, per ticket in advance and 25 at the door. So if you decide to come at the last minute, and we certainly welcome you, it's 25 but it's best to buy tickets in advance. Uh, and after the first of the year, we'll have them available at Family Natural Foods in Wisconsin Rapids, Beavers, and Country Freckles, which is next to Burger King in Wisconsin yes, yeah. Rapids. And in Beavers in Nakusa. And Beavers in Nakusa, <laughs> right on Main Street in Nakusa. So uh, if you got an opportunity and you'd like to do that, I know we have probably uh, 60 or 70 people that have come almost every year. Mm. And then there is about a changing 60 or 70 that come maybe every third year or brand new people. So I really encourage you to get your tickets in advance. So uh, Tom knows how much, uh, otherwise I keep coming in and say, Tom, can we take six more? And he'll say, I don't know. I don't know, you can only <laughs> put so much water in the gravy. You're right. <laughs> but <laughs> that's what I always tell him. I don't do loaves and fishes. That's way <laughs> above my pay job, yes. my, my, my pay scale. But um, we've never ran out. Right. And last year we had 174, I want to say. Maybe some. I know we it. set up extra tables last year from the 160 that we normally set, normally for. set for. And I'm very happy when they do that. Yes. It, it makes us feel good. And there's nothing better than it gets quiet when they're eating. And mm. it's all of a sudden it's like, that's the greatest compliment you can get. Or if you take the roll and wipe up the plate. Yes. Now, that might not be good etiquette. Right. Julia Child or... Whoever. Irma Bombeck probably doesn't like it, mm -hmm. but that's the greatest compliment in the world is if yeah. they take that little piece of bread and wipe up the plate at the end of the end of the day. Um, it's it's really cool. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would encourage you to get those tickets uh, uh, again at Family Natural Foods after the first of the year. Beavers, uh, the Dime Store, and Nakusa. On, I guess it's their Main Street is called Market Avenue, and Country Freckles on 8th Street uh, South uh, next to Burger King. Uh, and I think, Tom, this is a good segue. Let's go check a little bit more about the cooking class and how that went. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. you know, I haven't seen that, that, that film. Well, let's so. take a look. All right. Tom, do you want to describe what you're doing? Well, we're going to take and put our paper underneath our charcoal chimney and then light it. And the paper will ignite the charcoal. It's just plain old briquettes. There's a desk over there. Um, matches. Abby, can you grab that can of matches right there? It is pretty interesting. They, they developed them. You want to see some beautiful wheat? There's a wheat up there with heads. Oh. on it that, that would just turn your head 
but then the metal the, underneath, but the wing is even when you put your charcoal here, tall, tall. Dutch oven on it, the worst you can do is, uh, oh. uh, or the best you can do is to put something underneath so the charcoal isn't right on the ground. Sure. Even aluminum foil folded up a couple thicknesses works really well. Uh, these are, that was an old aluminum griddle that Mark's grandpa had. That he now uses for this. Yeah, I don't know, it was two bucks at a thrift store. So, wow. <laughs> so uh, <coughs> but uh, to reflect the heat back up. Sure. Okay. That's the whole deal here. And that the paper, if you listen to Elton Brown on the, on the Food Network, you put a little a couple drops of oil on it. And I've never found that necessary, but. <laughs> no, I mean, this stuff. Well, it makes little, it burn slower. Hold up piece of paper. Yeah, it, it burns a little slower, but but it, it uh, does a nice job. There. <laughs> and that'll come up within 20 minutes. That'll come up. <laughs> Rosemary chicken recipe I'd found on a actually a McCormick's thing that was hanging on a tag in the grocery store. And we kind of adapted it a little bit just to make it um, make it a whole meal. It didn't have chicken in it or uh, those things, potatoes in it originally. So we'll get going here, and you guys can help. I'm uh, so I've got my big Dutch oven. It's seasoned well. I'm not going to bother putting any spray in it or anything. I'm using what's called an ulu to uh, cut up the uh, potatoes. Um, this is actually an Eskimo Alaskan tool. Um, Probably started out as a piece of flint. Piece of flint or piece of whalebone. Yeah. And they make them like this. They make them a little more square. I use them just for chopping vegetables. They use them for cleaning fish. I, uh, if uh, reindeer, everything. A couple years ago when uh, Sarah Palin's Alaska was on, they had Todd's Eskimo grandma who's at that time was 90 something and she's gutting salmon or filleting salmon complete clean on a salmon two fillets in less than 30 seconds with one of these I don't know how she did it it takes me three minutes with a fillet knife but she was and again I so it's like like your adopted grandma cleaning squirrels yeah exactly and she was Ojibwe so there yeah, you know. knows. <clears throat> so if somebody wants to assist with the potatoes, you can play with the ulu, or I've got a knife. Don't the shit. Just hop right Jump in. Jump right in. Take your pick. Yeah, there's Take your pick. a bucket of potatoes. With the ulu, all of them. All of them. With the ulu, you want to point the bevel in the direction you're cutting. So if you're right here, just like that, if you're right-handed, the bevel goes to the right. Oh, good. So. Yeah. The recipe calls for rosemary, you, I'd warm that up a little before I put the biscuits in. which I'm going to, to break up in here just so it's not. And what year are we like cooking that. now? I don't know. About what year? Well, I'm just we making. From... Right now it's 2017 because we're doing. <laughs> no, no, I'm not. I'm not trying to be funny. Uh, this one will be more modern. We're using antique tools. But we're going to use them a lot more like you might at home. Yeah, I, I'm you know, or over the fire. Yeah, I'm using a recipe that I found somewhere, and you can really. I, I do lasagna in a Dutch oven. I take the Barilla no bake lasagna recipe off the back of the package and make it in a Dutch oven. Just don't get it too hot. Yeah. You you can you can adapt just about anything, and we'll talk about temperature when we throw this on the fire. So I got rosemary. I got paprika. Uh, the box is back here. Some time. Yeah. And 
salt and pepper. Perfect. Were Dutch ovens without the legs also uh, used in like a bed of coals and then they were covered with coals? And we'll, we'll get to that too. Oh, There's, okay. okay, the, okay. These are, are called camp ovens. They've got the legs, they've got the ring on the top. We've got some that are more, yeah, the Dutch. These are, if you want to get technical about what we always call these Dutch ovens, but these are technically camp ovens. Okay. And then um, there's also, you know, the fry pans, a fry pan with legs is a spider. If somebody wants to cut those in half, yeah, spiders, give or take. Carrots I'm just going to throw in. I'm using baby carrots because they're just so cute. You just halves, right? Yeah. Then you can just chuck them in there. Okay. <laughs> I did it a dozen times last week. Last and really well. just putting some olive oil. I was wondering where these went. <laughs> there it is. Bam. Ah. <laughs> Safe place, I guess. <laughs> and just to make it interesting, I've got some garlic infused. <laughs> he likes to cook. And, and you start liking to cook people buy you stuff. They bought me a whole bunch of these bottles for Christmas. And the neat thing about this is what I'll probably do is there's garlic in there. I'll probably when this when I get home dump more olive oil in there and then have more garlic infused. And then we've got drumsticks. We've got more drumsticks than a snare line. I'm going to throw them in the garbage bag. That was nice. Yeah, the, the white one behind you is a garbage bag. Oh, okay. Where did the. What are you looking for? A mitt. Uh, I'm here's a mitt. Okay. Oh, yeah, the that's, welding that's... There's a left-handed welding glove there. Okay. There was a right-handed one somewhere, too. Yeah, I just brought a left, yeah. but I, you, had a, well, you I, had a pair, too. I have a pair, too, so... There's a right one over there. Oh! I'm glad it wasn't a bear. <laughs> Called the art of camouflage. So we're just gonna toss this together a little bit just to get it mixed around. And probably in a perfect world, I would do this in a big bowl, but the object is to be primitive tonight, so. Lots of wooden spoons and metal spoons over there. I think wooden ones are better. Yeah. Just personally. No, in the uh, over in that brown box. And I'm just gonna dump that in and work it, kind of stack, stir it around. Um, Jackie. Oh, yes, sir. Cats. In that, there should be a little rubber spatula in that box, that white box, right that your hand was just in. That box, right. The box, okay. that box, no. Let's Look inside, cool something no, on the bottom. Okay. This, this is yeah, under here, under here, uh, white rubber. Uh, sweet fern. A little one, there. maybe a big one. Big one's fine. Here, little one, no, you're already, uh, I got that. It's dirty. You already got your hand dirty. Use it's that. dirty. Um, I'm kind of a stickler on the on my cast iron, just that I don't like to use um, metal utensils with it. I'll so use either covered. wooden, you know, if I'm trying to be authentic, or plastic, door, so I, <laughs> just because you don't want to wreck the, the, the seasoning. And it grows, I mean, there's so, I'm going to go on, I'm going to get all the legs back on top here. To pick some when I was working there. Oh, crap. Try and get its skin up so it <laughs> hopefully gets a little yeah, crispy. I got a <laughs> it grows south of Clover and west of Clover, and my cousin used it. Okay, and have we got coals yet, Dad? And what's going to happen is the juice from the chicken, along with the 
Uh -huh. um, and then olive oil is going to come down and as much as you can. You put a little bit of a glaze on the potatoes. You're just extracting the juice and whatever. Okay, just put a little in there. water with it and, and yeah, mm. and then <clears throat> you keep keep a jar of it okay. in the refrigerator. And she was on. Um, so we're going to go on the back of this over by the fire. Yeah. Really, really bad. Yeah. We're going to set our oven for 350 and cook this the liquid. Yeah. You want to carry tools of destruction this, this with is, you. Uh, Abby, this is the plant. Okay. Yep. She says it grows up near Plover. Mm -hmm. I know it grows north of Highway 8 all over. And it's supposed to be in wet but poor soil. According to the Yeah. So it, 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 this part looks like a fern. This part doesn't, so it's easy to not confuse them. Yeah, Although you can eat fern in the spring, the fiddleheads. Yeah. And in fact, we, we did that one year here. And Tom, what is that plant called? Uh, sweet fern. Sweet fern. Yeah, and it's, mm -hmm. it's not a fern, but that's that's what it's called. Oh. It's a low, marshy bush. And what would we use that for? Tea. Or she said that, uh, that the Native Americans used it for poison ivy. They would make a oh. tincture of Look it or tea. whatever, yeah, yeah. yeah, with water. And then uh, I'll rub it on, mm -hmm. oh. and that helps with poison ivy. So I didn't know that, but I'm very glad. Yeah, we didn't know that I, either. So we keep I have not had poison ivy in many years, but I have had it to the point that I thought I was I, going. They're not quite there yet, but we're going to do it anyway. Okay, so we've got two chimneys going here, one that I'd started beforehand like they do on TV, so it's ready when we go. We're on TV. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring it off here and I am going to dump, well, that was supposed to be eight, eight or ten briquettes underneath it. I'm trying to hit a temperature of about 350, which um, there's some math involved with that. Um, with a standard Dutch oven, one of the shallower ones like this, that would be about 20 coals, and you'd want two thirds on top, one third on the bottom. Um, so I would go with eight on the bottom. I've probably still got 15 down here. But because this is a deeper one, it loses it loses heat, so you have to put more on the top. So, and I'm going to put a couple. One, two, three, four, five, six, nine. Because these are kind of a couple of these are kind of small. <coughs> and you want to arrange them in somewhat of a even pattern so you, you heat your camp oven evenly. And there's a neat pretty primitive, but it's a neat museum there on top. And then if I was using the shallower oven, I'd probably put about 12 on top. I'm going to do more than 20. Um, there's a couple of methods of trying to, to get the temperature right. One of the common ones, and it works well using coals, too, is ring of fire, which means typically a one ring around the outside will bring you up between 325 and 350. And the second ring will bring you up an extra 50 degrees. Um, with this being a deeper one, I usually pretty much cover it. Because again, we're trying to cook through. So we'll see where that goes. And these are smaller ones. <laughs> so we're just going to leave that. Anybody got the time? Um, tools and toys for handling this stuff. Um, this is just a cheap pair of tongs I probably bought at Walmart or Goodwill. Um, the longer barbecue ones that are useless for picking up chicken work really good for charcoal too. The kind of wiry one. This is a pair of channel lock pliers. Borrowed them about 30 years ago. I borrowed um, them from your grandpa so it didn't make yeah. any difference. <laughs> and a couple years ago we had the blacksmith out here put a ring on them. They're a hook. So then I can go and pick up, I can pick it up, I can 
grab the lid with a certain amount of control. I can grab the edge of the lid, grab different pots and pans. These are really handy. Do not buy the cheap speed Boy Scout or Walmart aluminum ones. They will get hot. They will melt. You will burn your hand. Um, I've also done it at home. I've got a pair of channel locks that still have the rubber on them. These didn't. But you just go buy a pair of cheap channel locks out of the junk bin at the hardware store. This is a Lodge Dutch oven carrier lid lifter. Um, a lot of the kitchen stores carry them now. I think Walmart carries them too. So you can, it goes in like such. And you can pick the lid right up. I don't want to do it right now. Um, and you can carry the bale as well. So what time we got? We have 6.25. 5.25. 5.25. Yeah, okay. like I said. <laughs> <laughs> um, 6.25 Eastern, I guess. Okay. Um, so in about 15 minutes, we're going to come and turn that. Okay. So um, if you want to talk about you whatever your... Your bread's going to take like 25 minutes. So we do a little bit more, so in about 15 minutes. Why don't you heat up a Dutch oven? You can help with that, Mark. Yeah. Uh, get one for that loaf of bread. Um, bring whichever one you want over here. Okay. Any aluminum foil? I like to put aluminum foil or something <laughs> underneath them, like he's doing there. Uh, Jackie's got aluminum foil. She's doing cobbler. Yeah, and I... I'm just going to dump this, but you try, you know, especially if you're cooking at the family reunion at the county park, they get kind of uppity with it when you kill the grass. Those things get damn hot. Um, the heat shield on them works well. Do um, you know why it's under us? Okay. We can put some charcoal in If you're looking for a chimney, I, I use them, love them for starting the grill too. If you're looking for them, I the These are the Weber brand. They're 14, 15 bucks. There are cheaper ones out there with a wooden handle that are nine, ten bucks. Save your money. Buy the and go buy the good one. Buy the good one. Buy. Yeah. And there's other brands out there. This is you know what you're gonna find at, at Walmart, Menards. But the cheap ones. What happens?